All right. Well, we are a few minutes after seven. I think folks will continue um, streaming in. My colleague Riley is here and she'll help me manage that, that side of things. Um, I will start presenting here. Um, Wonderful, great. So my name is Natalie Hennigan and I'm the education manager at Rethos Places Reimagined, um, which is the host and, and creator of, of this class. Um, and I just wanna say a special thanks to the city of Northfield for um, encouraging this class and co-hosting it and, and sharing about um, this content. Um, Northfield is a member of Minnesota Green Step Cities. Um, and, and I was trying to find the total number of Green Step Cities across the state, but there are tons of cities who participate in this step-by-step -step incentive program for achieving energy efficiency and sustainability goals. Um, and so education and outreach are, are a key part of it and, and growing part, I think, of, of the Green Step Cities work. And so um, all of Rethos's work, I think, aligns really nicely with um, the goals of Green Step City. So we're glad to, to team up for this effort. A little bit about Rethos. Um, we are a regional nonprofit. We're based in St. Paul. That's where I'm um, calling you from. But we have offices throughout the state of Minnesota. And we work for the reuse and reimagining of old buildings and places. Um, we do our work on a variety of fronts. First of all, we advocate at the state and national level for preservation and building reuse policies. Um, we have a robust slate of programs focused on rural Minnesota. Um, we are also the um, parent organization of Minnesota Main Streets. Northfield is one of our designated Main Street communities as well, <clears throat> focused on the reuse of old buildings for um, economic development in, in downtown districts. And then we also um, focus on community engagement and education as um, key ways to support individuals and communities around building reuse. So Rethos's education program is all about connecting folks, homeowners, DIYers, property owners, um, rehabbers to the skills and the tools that they need in order to take good care of, of the places where they live. And so um, our, our education program has taken a variety of shapes tours, talks, hands-on workshops, and then of course in the past year to um, lots of webinars and digital learning opportunities. Um, but we really believe that, you know, we can, we can talk about the value of, of reuse and revitalizing old buildings, but if we don't actually teach those skills, um, we won't have nearly as great of an impact. So um, we believe that we can have um, a really positive effect on the state of our old buildings if we can power up uh, homeowners and property owners uh, to take care of some projects themselves or to understand a little bit better um, where to go for help when, they, when they're tackling some of these projects. <clears throat> I'm showing you some scenes from some in-person classes, more for my own sake, because I really miss these classes, right? <laughs> when we could all be the right to my and... house. Yeah, oh, that's right, Jesse. <laughs> this is Jesse's house in Minneapolis. Oh, yeah, an excellent uh, class attendee and and a uh, host of workshops. <laughs> Thanks for calling that out. Um, yeah, so in our classes, you know, we, and we try to teach not just how we're repairing and rehabbing old homes, but how old homes function. And a lot of that involves some myth busting, right? And that's how this class kind of um, came to be, why old is green. Um, and this class was originally developed by um, my colleague and friend, Alyssa Peer. And Alyssa is an architect and she's way smarter than me. Um, and it's, <laughs> this is a distilled version of, of her content. Um, but I hope that, you know, my perspective, having managed this program and, and focused on the education and outreach side of building reuse can help us all sort of consider how the reusable buildings can be a part, a key part of, of a sustainable future. So today we're talking about why old homes are green, how old homes are green. And I think a lot of times, you know, we don't often put those phrases together, old homes and green, unless we're talking about paint color or something, because there are a lot of preconceived notions about what green is, right? We think of really modern designs and sleek looking buildings and glass and solar panels. And all of these are great and green things, but so are these houses, right? wood frames, stucco houses, houses that need maybe a little bit of love, um, houses that live in a variety of climates. These can be greenhouses too. Um, here's maybe a, a perhaps classic looking example of a LEED gold certified building, um, a, a, another modern design um, at, within the last, you know, just over a decade or so. 
but this is also a LEED certified building. Um, this is the Baton Rouge Junior High, about a hundred year old building that was rehabbed and restored. Um, and uh, it was reused using 95% of the existing structure of the building, um, which is pretty impressive and, and attained LEED certified um, uh, status. So I'm going to just talk through a couple um, definitions for the sake of sort of getting us all um, on the same page. Um, and I like this definition of green building. So this is the practice of creating structures and using processes that are environmentally responsible and resource efficient throughout a building's life cycle from siting to design, construction, operation, maintenance, renovation, and deconstruction. And I think this is important because um, we recognize that, you know, a green building is not just how it operates. It's not just a building that has, you know, solar panels or the lights go off when we leave the room or whatever. It's super efficient when it's being used. Um, green building is about the whole process, how we got to that point of having a building exist and how we take care of it after it's outlived its usefulness, perhaps. But we also have to talk about green washing when we talk about green building. Um, so anything can be green if anyone says it is because there's no official definition of green. And um, I'm, I, I fall into the trap of, you know, buying the dish soap that has the flowers on it or whatever because it looks green and, and uh, this is a very easy thing to do. We don't like to, you know, do our research all the time and, and we like to buy our way um, into, you know, sustainable practices often. Um, but it is important that we understand, you know, that um, not everything that is labeled green is actually green. And, you know, not everything that maybe seems uh, not green, you know, that, that those things often can be um, um, just as or more sustainable as the so-called green option. So it's up to us as the consumer, as the user, as the building steward um, to do our research and to understand, you know, what we are actually um, dealing with. <clears throat> So I like this definition of sustainable too, which is perhaps a nice alternative to green, um, capable of being maintained at a steady level without, without exhausting natural resources or causing severe ecological damage. And to me, this means that sustainab sustainability equals balance. We're not putting too much pressure on things that we don't need um, in order to, to meet our own immediate needs. And to take that a step further into development, um, sustainable development is, uh, meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So again, taking into consideration a little bit more than just what our own immediate um, um, needs and desires and uses are. Uh, this, this article made the rounds a couple years ago and I really liked the headline, we recycle buildings, why don't, or sorry, we recycle bottles, why don't we recycle buildings? And of course the easy answer is it's a lot harder to do, right? But I like the fact that they, you know, put these two things together and make us consider that recycling bottles, recycling cardboard has become a very natural, obvious choice for us as consumers. But recycling buildings, reusing buildings isn't quite seen as, as a normal or, or, you know, first choice um, option. And, and why not, right? Um, we recycle all of these, all of these, you know, products, but we don't apply the same ethic to our largest manufactured product buildings. And so, when we think about, you know, the places where we could possibly have the greatest impact, um, it's worth looking at where are we already making um, the biggest. Uh, the, 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 we're already having the, the biggest impact in terms of wastefulness and energy consumption. So I think, you know, it, it's a bit, again about reframing our, our ideas about um, recycling and reuse, looking at a project like this, the, the rehabilitation of an 1850s little house as an act of reuse and recycling and looking at the demolition of this beautiful house as, you know, throwing something in the trash that doesn't belong in the trash. You know, what if we looked at a project like this with the same sort of, you know, a stink eye that we might have if somebody threw their LaCroix can in the trash, right? It's just, it's, it's wrong. You can't, you can't do that. Um, and a quote from that article that I uh, just uh, showed you the headline of that I really like, a building can only be considered truly sustainable if it remains in use for long enough to justify the resources invested in its creation. And this brings up the concept of um, embodied energy. 
And embodied energy is the energy used in the whole process of building, including extraction, processing, manufacturing, transportation, and assembly of all the materials used. And this chart sort of nicely describes all of these different um, pieces of the puzzle. Again, it's not just about how a building operates once you know it's in use. Um, there's a lot of energy expended just to get it to day one. Um, the statistic down here is really important, I think. It takes about 20 years of a typical building's 100-year operation to offset the energy expenditure of its construction. So you'll often hear that, um, uh, you know, in, in, old, in terms of old buildings, old buildings have paid off their carbon debt, right? They've been long enough in, in use long enough to justify that upfront expense um, of energy and materials. And it's also important to think about in terms of new construction, right? Like we can build a really, you know, super efficient, sustainable building, um, but there was a lot that took to get it to that point. And so that building needs to be useful for quite some time in order to justify, again, that upfront expense. Oh, and I wanted to say too, because I see the chat kind of go in here. Um, thanks to everyone who has participated so far. Because I'm presenting and, um, well, because I am presenting, I can't quite check in on the chat as often as, as I would like, but I'll, I'll be sure to take a couple of breaks. Um, feel free to throw any questions in the chat. Um, and and I, will, I will be sure either to try and answer myself or connect you to the right answer. Um, I like this, uh, another uh, view of embodied energy here too. Um, and in part because, you know, here at this point, once a building is deemed to be no longer useful, um, the cycle ends, right? And we, we throw all of the materials in the landfill. And if we can keep a building or its component parts in use, we keep this cycle going. And it not only relieves the pressure on our landfills, um, and, and it keeps stuff out of the trash, but it also relieves pressure on the extraction piece. Um, so when we keep these materials in use, we're not demanding that new products be created. And here's yet another um, uh, visualization of this. So all of the different component parts to make an average sized home. And I wanna draw your attention um, down here. I hope you can see my cursor, um, the, the pie chart on the left that shows the fossil fuel energy expenditure by activity in creating a home. And nearly all of the energy expenditure is on manufacturing the materials. And construction and transporting those materials are the other two slivers here. So again, thinking about where we can have the greatest impact, that pressure on creating new and always generating new materials rather than using and reusing what we already have on site or what we already have in massive reuse warehouses, um, that can have a huge impact on reducing that um, energy consumption there. So here's a little stat for you. In the United States, building construction and operation is responsible for about three quarters of all energy consumption and about half of all CO2 emissions. So building construction and operation is responsible for that much of our energy consumption and emissions. A 2012 study estimated that 82 billion square feet of existing buildings would be demolished and replaced in the United States between 2005 and 2030. And how much is 82 billion square feet? That's about a third of the U United States existing building stock. So imagine that in the course of 25 years, you know, one third of, of your block is demolished and not just demolished, thrown in the trash, but replaced with new construction, with all of those new, ma new materials being extracted and manufactured and transported and all of that. That's massive. So I wanted to sort of present some of these big, you know, the concepts and, and ideas about, you know, sort of what we're up against, like what's, what's, the, what's the context um, in which we're talking about um, the sustainability of our own old homes. And so I hope to focus in on, on how those of us, you know, we live in old homes or we use old buildings. Um, how do we in our daily lives consider how old buildings can be a part of, of a sustainable lifestyle and a sustainable future? So I'm going to talk a bit about sustainability as it relates to old home materials and old home design. But first, back to a couple definitions. So we, we're familiar with the idea of a carbon footprint, right? Our personal environmental impact. And you can calculate your carbon footprint. Um, and 
or I can just tell you that the average US resident's carbon footprint is about five times the global average. And all of these things make up our carbon footprint and how we live in and use our homes, especially our older homes that are aging and, and likely have the potential to you know, easily turn into trash. Um, how we use those and reuse those materials is a key part of our own um, environmental impact. Um, while I have these links up, I wanted to um, remind you that at about six o'clock, I sent out um, a little resource packet um, to go along with this class. If you happened to register in the last hour before um, we, we started, you might not have received that. Um, so I'll get that out to you. But all of the links and most of the um, graphics or charts that are that are on this presentation are in in that packet for you to for you to see. And I'm happy to share any links or other information that piques your fancy, piques your interest um, uh, uh, throughout the presentation. Oops. So one thing we talk about a lot in our classes and our Rethos classes and, and, and when we talk about sustainability and building reuse um, together is this idea of resilience. So can this house, can this building adapt or respond to future changes? And if so, how? Are the materials used to create this house repairable or are they replaceable? So this brings up the question of proactive maintenance versus big costly repairs. A lot of the things we teach in our classes at Rethos are just like, how to just, what are your seasonal to do's? You know, what are the things annually you're checking up on your house for so that you're not dealing with big, you know, water infiltration issues that are causing, you know, rot and cracks and all sorts of like scary things down the road. What can you do to just to keep this stuff in use as long as possible and, and operating as best as it can um, before you're faced with some, some big scary problem. We also talk about return on investment. Um, and we consider this both in terms of our house as a whole system or the materials within it, right? What are the, what's the upfront cost? What's the replacement cost? Or are you able to repair and maintain these materials in place? What's the durability of all of these materials? Um, can they be adapted and, and shifted to, to, make, to meet your needs? And then how does that factor into the full life cycle cost of, of living in and owning or stewarding our homes? So Alyssa, the creator of this class, likes to ask this question, what does old know? And a lot of times people will walk into an old house and, and just be terrified, like, oh, it's drafty, this is cracks there, and it kind of smells weird and whatever. It's, you know, lots of, lots of unknown, so to speak. Um, but if we flip that around, we can actually say that all of these signs, all of these things going on in our old homes are clues for what we need to do, what problems we need to fix. So an old home, it's defined the land it's on is settled. So cracks, if they're gonna happen, have probably happened. Um, water infiltration, if there's leaks coming in, that's where the water's coming in, right? And we're not gonna be surprised by, um, you know, a crack in a, in a new place or, 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 water, or water coming in from a new home that's settling on all that fresh dirt. Um, if you can smell, you know, a, a, a moldy or s smell or something like that, you know that that's a problem you need to take care of versus walking into a, you know, brand new, fresh looking, uh, uh, new construction home and thinking, oh, it's great. Well, no, ho no home is maintenance free and those problems will arise. An old home tells you where those problems are already existing. I, I included this photo because um, this is from a, a workshop we hosted. I think Beverly actually attended or these webinars um, we hosted last fall from the Cox House in, in St. Peter. And um, our instructor for this class uh, was walking around the house doing a sort of a, a conditions assessment um, from the exterior. And she stood at this corner of the porch and you can't see it in the photo, but the gutter um, was not properly attached to the roof at this point. So every time it rained, water just came straight down the side, straight down the pillar and onto this like soft part of um, the lawn here. And because of this clear like water management issue, our instructor, our restorationist could sort of assess like maybe this is why a lot of the problems you can also visibly see paint peeling cracks um, and weird settling are happening because um, the, the, the landscaping is, is a little wonky and the water is not running away from the house as it should. And so just from this one point, we could sort of assess like what are all of these different issues that could be going on, on in the house and prioritize needed repairs um, or maintenance going forward. 
Okay, so I'm going to step through some of the materials that we'll often find in old homes and how they how they sort of play into um, the idea of sustainability. And when I'm talking about old homes, I know that's really vague. Some people say, you know, historic or vintage or whatever. Old homes in this case I'm talking are sort of pre-mid-century. Um, and some of the materials we'll talk about um, carry through, uh, you know, may see maybe more into the 60s and 70s. Um, but that's sort of the, the the vintage we're talking about here. Oh, and I threw this in at the last minute. This was a fun thing that um, an architect friend sent to me that I thought might be interesting because um, it, it compares the um, uh, fire resistance of building materials in old home, actually like mid-century homes versus new homes. And just to highlight a couple, I mean, I, I didn't really know much about this at all. Um, and so some of this was quite surprising. Um, wood flooring, for example, a floor built from traditional lumber collapsed about 18 and a half minutes after ignition versus a floor built from engineered lumber in say the last decade collapsed in about six minutes under the same conditions. Um, you see a similar nearly twice as long, uh, you know, old doors and windows lasted nearly twice as long versus new modern um, vinyl windows. Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, plaster in a couple seconds, but um, plaster uh, uh, was breached 74 minutes after ignition, whereas um, gypsum board under the same conditions was breached 23 minutes and 30 seconds. So um, I guess when it comes to fire safety, old home materials are definitely are definitely your best bet. Um, I thought that was interesting and, and just uh, worth sharing. I don't think this one's in your packet. So if you want, if you're, if you're interested in, in lo looking at that again, I can send that out later. Okay, so the materials, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll start with the good, right? Um, hardwood floors, brick, plaster, tile, all of these things are sort of the obvious nice things in older homes, right? Um, they're the stuff that real estate agents will, will you know, uh, uh, market, um, the stuff that we ooh and ah over when we walk inside an old home. And they're the stuff that can't easily be created, recreated, if at all. Um, so if we remove this beautiful, you know, wood trim um, or remove some old fixtures, it's really, really hard and prohibitively expensive to recreate that stuff. Um, and you know, beyond just the aesthetics, obviously there's there's a quality and value in that. I want to talk a bit about um, the durability and actually the the, the, the essence of these materials. Um, that we find in older homes and specifically the wood. Um, so when we're talking about older homes, this stuff is built with old growth wood. And here on the right, we see a comparison between old growth wood and newer wood. Um, this on the left here is old growth wood. And you can see all of these nice and tight rings. And the rings, resemble, the rings um, indicate durability and resistance, right? Whereas this newer wood on the right here, you can count maybe seven or eight rings. And in between each rings, each ring is nice, soft, pulpy wood. That's really, really good for rot and termites. And so the tighter the rings, the denser the wood, the more resistant it is to these really nasty things that can completely ruin um, a piece of wood or, or um, a window, a, you know, a frame, anything like that. Um, and in addition to just being um, durable against these um, nasty things that, that can happen in our, in our homes, um, old growth wood is, is inherently more adaptable and more repairable. It stands up to a lot of stuff. When we think about in a house that was built in 1921, the wood used in that home is at least 100 years old already. And so the wood we're dealing with in these homes, um, my, host, my house is uh, 1911. Um, you know, this wood is, is centuries old. It has seen winter after winter of expand thaw and, and all of these things that, that, that build up its resistance to um, um, the nasty stuff. And so the, this old growth wood, um, we're lucky enough it shows up all over our homes, right? In windows, in flooring, in framing. And um, here on the left, you see a photo. This is um, a Retho student um, re-roping a, a, a sash cord here. And the windows themselves, I mean, these are, are we'll talk about windows in a little bit, but um, one of the uh, window restorers who we work with, who teaches some classes for us, he often likes to tell the story of how um, folks will call his workshop and say, you know, I have 
lots of you know, rot issues on my on my um, windows. I hope you can help. My home is from the 80s. And he'll ask the 1880s or the 1980s. And um, more often than not, it's the 1980s, right? Because this these windows are built with this new, like fleshy young wood, and it's incredibly susceptible to rot issues. Rot certainly can happen in these older windows, um, but the beauty is uh, there are repair techniques that you can, um, that allow you to maintain as much of that original wood as possible, cut out the portion and get to the source of the rot um, and repair it with um, a variety of techniques so that you can actually keep the majority of your window, the majority of the material in use um, and, and, and keep it um, functioning properly. And the same deal with floors. They were designed to be sanded. They were designed to be refinished. Um, wood floors, you know, um, builders would, they, they, they built in the possibility of sanding down and refinishing your floors time and time again. So you could have that like new look um, to your floors for decades. Um, and, and nothing like that happens anymore when you're building new construction with the cost of materials, who's giving you extra material just so that you can, you know, refinish and polish your floors um, um, over the course of over the course of your house's life. Um, these are photos from uh, another um, couple who took some classes from Rethos and they removed this yucky linoleum and the weird mastic stuff underneath. And with their own sweat and blood, uh, uh, sanded down and refinished all the floors um, in their in, on the first floor of their home, and they just look gorgeous. Um, this old growth wood is, of course, also used in the framing of our homes, and we see on the right here uh, balloon framing, which is how we used to build old homes, with two story long, um, two story high pieces of lumber with the floor suspended in between. And we moved away from balloon framing to platform framing where you build just one story, build a floor, and then another story. A lot of folks think that, you know, we, we moved away from balloon framing because it was a major fire hazard, which is true. Um, with these big two-story high channels, essentially, in the wall, um, you know, if a fire broke out on the first floor, it could... It could, it could zoom straight up to the second floor into the attic. And that was really dangerous. Um, but the real reason we moved to platform framing was because we simply didn't have lumber long enough or straight enough to um, continue building two stories at a time. Now it's really difficult to find like a straight or sturdy looking two by four if you go to the hardware store. Um, so this is, um, you know, when, when we're thinking about um, the, the good materials in our home, it's not just the pretty stuff on the outside, but the guts of our house as well. Um, here's just uh, a moment for us to breathe and, and enjoy this beautiful woodwork in this home. Before we move on to the bad, right? <laughs> so um, I won't spend too much time talking about these issues actually because um, shameless plug, we're hosting a class exclusively, two hours exclusively about asbestos, lead, and radon um, in a couple of weeks. So um, sign up for that class. Um, but this is, this is a key example actually when we're working with homeowners who are, you know, say, considering purchasing an old home or they just bought their first old home, um, sort of demystifying some of these really scary and admittedly dangerous um, materials is a big part of the process because, you know, some folks are like, they won't touch an old house with a 10 foot pole, like, oh, asbestos, lead paint, all that gross stuff. Like, why would I even, it's so dangerous. Um, but this is where knowledge is power, right? And if you understand as a homeowner and as a community member, as a neighbor, um, that these materials, you understand, you know, where they came from, why they're there in the first place, um, when and how they can be dangerous to you and how we can take good care of them, how we can remove them, um, then you're gold, then you're good. So, um, you know, with asbestos, we often see that, I mean, you can see that in, you know, um, uh, floor tiles or, or um, exterior siding, but often as insulation around um, pipes. And when it looks like this, it's actually okay. It's not dangerous if it's agitated and it becomes sort of flaky and gets into small dusty and, you know, particles and gets in your lungs. That's of course when it's dangerous, um, but you can easily and affordably have it tested and abated or removed. Um, lead paint, of course, is, is a big issue in houses before 1978. Likely the lead, or likely the paint had lead in it. <clears throat> and it was used because it was super durable. Lead paint lasts a really long time until it doesn't. And this is when we start to see like 
paint chips falling off. And even if you have layers and layers of new post 1978 paint on top of your lead paint. Um, once that once that lead layer um, starts to fail and flake off, it takes the new paint with it. And then you have these apparently really sweet um, the chips of, of lead paint. And that's where you know um, folks get concerned about, about children snacking on them or ingesting them. And it can be a, re a really scary issue. Um, there are excellent resources and a couple, two specific resources in the packet that I sent out um, that offer step-by-step -step guides for homeowners to deal with lead paint safely. This often comes up with window restoration as well. Um, it requires some you know, simple equipment, PPE, and the right tools. And often if you live in a neighborhood of you know, 1920s houses and other folks have done similar projects, maybe one of your neighbors has some of the maybe harder to find or just more expensive equipment like a HEPA vac or a heat gun or something. Um, and if you are you know, eager and ready to do that work yourself, um, uh, you, can, you can seek out help and, and, and guidance to, to walk your way through it. Um, and it really can be done. Um, Jesse maybe could talk about that too. I think you had lead paint um, windows. Anyway, um, radon, it's just as much of an issue in new houses as old. Um, so don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, mold, again, back to the plaster versus sheetrock. Um, mold is much more likely to chew on uh, delicious sheetrock, which is just gypsum board with paper on either side and paper is awesome for mold. And especially in newer construction where um, our houses are built quite airtight. If water gets in, it's very likely not getting out. Um, and so our, we see a lot of, of mold issues with, with newer construction, um, uh, uh, more so often than, than older homes. So again, understanding you know, when and where these things happen and how to take care of them is a big part of, of you know, um, taking care of your house in, in a sustainable um, manner. And then the ugly. So these are like the ugly ducklings, actually. Um, you know, <laughs> the things that at first glance people will will shy away from. Um, so first, you know, what is behind what you see? And I always wish I could offer like an X-ray view of of some of the you know older houses that they need a little work. They need maybe a paint job, or they need a little bit of of elbow grease to to really bring it to life. And I wish I could offer that. You know, like let's just see like what's what's behind here. What can we uncover, and what can we really um, let shine? Because oftentimes, you know, vinyl siding is covering up original clapboard siding, and often it has protected that wood from the elements for decades, which is pretty cool. Um, same with carpet or other, you know, newer flooring types um, can expose beautiful hardwood floors, again, that we haven't scratched up for decades. So sometimes it's, it's a blessing in disguise. Or sheetrock, of course, um, you know, makeshift walls um, covering up uh, original plaster too. Um, I won't, you know, say uh, too much about stucco either here. I mean, this is a whole, it's to be a whole other class topic, I guess. But stucco is one of those things that, um, I think gets a bad rap or is very confusing. You know, some people don't under, uh, don't, I was surprised too when, you know, stucco homes are all over the Twin Cities and there's a whole interesting um, history of why stucco arrived in Minnesota. And I don't know, I would presume Northfield has a decent number of, of, of stucco homes, but there are, you know, neighborhoods in, in St. Paul and Minneapolis that are just stucco home after stucco home. And they are often associated with warmer climate. So people think that, our, you know, freeze thaw is is antithetical to stucco's success here. Um, but actually, stucco is one of the most durable, um, energy efficient, and and fire resistant uh, exterior siding materials you could possibly have. Um, and yes, uh, sometimes there are cracks and sometimes there are stains. And oftentimes, small cracks aren't that big of a deal. Um, bigger cracks, you know, that that can be an issue, but. A lot of times stucco homes can last for decades and decades without, without any um, structural issues. The other thing to know about stucco is that it's porous. And so um, water can get inside the stucco and actually the line of defense with stucco, stucco is attached to you know, a, a metal lath, which is on top of a, a, a rain sheathing. And that is your barrier, that's your rain barrier. And so the water can then get ex expelled back out um, and, and stucco, it's, it's breathable. Um, so when people paint stucco, which is often an issue, people don't like say the natural tones of original stucco or you know it's dirty and, and they wanna cover up some cracks or cover up some things, they'll paint stucco and like 
really cool, bold homes are, are, are kind of, you know, that's kind of a fad now. Um, but paint can actually trap water inside, cause that metal lath to rust, and then cause the stucco to fall off, creating larger cracks. And that's what can, when it can be a really serious issue. So again, we could talk about stucco for a long time, um, but this is again, a key example of when it comes to, you know, successfully and sustainably stewarding an old home, really understanding what you're dealing with um, and, and preparing yourself for the unique circumstances of those materials to make sure they last as long as possible. So windows, um, I could and I have talked about windows for hours, but um, we all have a bedtime, so I won't talk about windows forever. Um, but the thing about old windows, and, and I could possibly be, you know, preaching to the choir here with some of this stuff, um, but I think this is really important and important too, as, as we, you know, go back into our worlds and are talking with our, our neighbors and colleagues about, um, about these things to, to really, you know, understand. Um, I'm trying to build an army of old window like advocates to go up against the um, replacement window industry, <laughs> if you can't tell. No, but um, so the thing about windows that I like to tell um, everybody is, is, you know, windows, they're holes in the wall, right? And they always will be. And we can create the best and finest and newest glass to put inside windows and they will never be as effective as insulating us from the outside as the wall right next to it. So yes, when you walk past your window, it's likely going to be a little chillier than the wall right next to it. And that's okay because windows only make up about 15% of our total building envelope. And so therefore they only really account for about 10% of energy loss in our home. And you know, when the, the window replacement manufacturers come around, they try to make these arguments about energy efficiency about cost effectiveness and about ease of maintenance. And they actually don't have a strong case with any of these things. Um, and it comes down to the numbers here. So um, perhaps you're familiar with the R value, right? So R value measures resistance to the transfer of heat. So a hole in the wall is R value of zero. There's no resistance. Um, an old window, so a single pane, double hung you know, window is an R value of one. So it's not great, right? An old window with a new storm window on top has an R value of two, definitely an improvement. A new window, so brand new, you know, two panes of thermal glass, maybe there's the argon gas in between, has an R value of 2.86. So still better, but not like extraordinarily better, especially when we consider that the typical R value of an exterior wall is 13. And so when we think about where the biggest bang for our buck is, it's insulating our walls and insulating our attic because already that's where the most heat is escaping from. And B, new windows are so expensive. And so the cost of putting in new windows and hoping to see a return on your energy bill, sure that might, your, your energy bill might decrease a little bit, but how long will it take you to pay off those windows? I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so this chart really nicely breaks down on the far left here. We have um, an original uh, uh, tuned up double hung window with a new storm window put on top. These numbers might be a little old, but say for the sake of example, this is cost 50 bucks. And um, they use U value, which is the inverse of R value. So U value of 0.5, R value of two, just like I showed you on the last screen. So the annual savings per window here is $13.20, which at $50 a window will cost, will take you four and a half years to pay off the cost of that window. On the far right here, we have, we threw out the original window and the storm, those are in the trash, and then we put in a brand new window unit for $550, which is low for these days, right? Um, annual energy savings from that window are $2.29 which will take you 240 years to see back. So, and again, in that time, you're probably replacing those windows like seven or eight times, right? Which leads us to sort of the crux of the issue is that original wood windows were designed to be repaired and not to be replaced. So when you buy a replacement window, it's this one massive mechanical unit made up of hundreds of tiny little parts that you can't replace or you can't repair on your own. When that window fails, you have to replace it in full. When you have an old window, like the one in this photo here, 
again, this is Jesse's garage, I think. <laughs> uh, this is made up of component parts, parts and materials you can get at the hardware store and you can fix on your own, or you can affordably hire somebody to do it yourself. Um, and, and the thing about this too is, you know, yeah, it takes a little bit of of technique or learning, um, but these are simple repairs that people have been doing for generations. Um, the same guy who told uh, the story about, um, you know, rot, uh, rotted windows most likely coming from the 1980s versus the 1880s, he also talks about um, being on site at a, uh, at a job at a house where he was um, spot glazing some, some old windows. And, um, uh, the neighbor came out, it was an older woman who came out and asked what his crew was up to. And he said, oh, we're, you know, we're reglazing these windows, tuning up these windows. And she said, oh, they're paying you to do that? Like, how ridiculous. This is sort of a regular task that, you know, when I was growing up was just as common as, I don't know, weeding the garden, you know, um, it was just a regular part of, of maintaining and, and, and keeping up our home. Um, Again, shameless plug, we host several window workshops a year. And so um, stay tuned for Rethos classes uh, uh, coming up. And then, okay, I'm gonna check, check the chat here. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. What about plastic windows that at some point replaced the original? How do they compare to other types? So I'm presuming if anything, a plastic or vinyl window is you know sort of like this it's a version of the same product that these companies are selling you know nowadays right and it is really unfortunate sometimes you know walk into an old house and and the original windows were were replaced in the 90s and now all of those replacement windows are failing um you know i think if you're in a bind like the thing about it is a really solid storm window is the is the most effective way you have to to make a a, a quick and easy improvement um to the efficiency and the operation of your windows um if if it's not time yet you know to to do a, a full replacement but um i hope that answers your question the yeah i mean the word plastic is just like oh you know like how you can't repair plastic you really can't um which is really which is really um too bad um once these old or original windows are gone um the opportunities for for repair are um are very minimal so i wanted to make a couple notes about deconstruction because a lot of the things we're talking about involve you know taking good care of stuff um in place as long as we can, right? And 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 that's really important. But houses and buildings will be demolished um, naturally. The, these are the forces at play here. Um, and uh, oh, I want to answer this before I continue because I see the window question. Um, oh, and I lost the chat. Sorry. I think I saw it was there was a question about if any any company is um, manufacturing new wood windows. And um, yes, there are. They're not cheap. Um, oh, here, here we go again. Sorry, little zoom weirdness. Is there any manufacturing still of old wood-based repairable windows? Yeah, so um, you can have, you know, custom wood windows built. There are some companies, I think A-Craft windows, um, A-Craft uh, makes some standard sizes of windows. Um, one thing that is like pretty fascinating to me, and, and this actually is relevant to the next point here, is that salvage shops and reuse warehouses like Bauer Brothers um, on the north side of Minneapolis uh, have like literally warehouse rooms full of old windows. And um, if you have, if you live, say like a standard, you know, I'm not sure, Claire, like what, where your house, what, what era your house is from, but maybe you live in, you know, 1920s home, you can probably find like standard window sizes Then it's in some of these warehouses. Um, it's not guaranteed that you're gonna find like 12 to match all the windows in your living room and dining room say, um, I'm not guaranteeing that at all. But I've always been curious to know if anybody would be like, willing to try that, you know, willing to salvage some materials and, and kind of reconstruct. The issue here is, of course, if you had new windows put in, um, the operation, the mechanics of the, the, the weight system might be defunct. Like oftentimes those cavities where the um, sash cord and the weights 
existed were filled in with insulation or filled in with, with something. Um, and so they might be closed off to like truly reconstructing it. That's kind of an out there um, recommendation. <laughs> but um, uh, there are some places that you can, if um, that you can uh, uh, purchase new wood windows that would be designed in the same way. Um, a craft is what I'll put in here. And I'll, I, I need to think about if there are others, they might be like special orders from places in New England, you know, perhaps, um, but I'm going to tuck that away and, and get back to that um, before the end of class too. Okay, so um, deconstruction. Again, so deconstruction is sort of emerging again now as an alternative to demolition of homes or of um, parts of buildings. I think a lot of people think of, of demolition or deconstruction as an entire house or an entire building, but it actually is a really awesome alternative to, um, you know, say a porch reconstruction or a kitchen renovation or something where a lot of material would typically just be thrown in a dumpster. Um, but uh, deconstruction is a lot more expensive than demolition. So it's, it's hard um, to convince uh, you know, uh, sort of the system we're in, the cities where we live, that this is a, a really reasonable and, 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 and um, environmentally responsible choice to make. So some cities like Portland, Oregon, um, who are sort of leading the charge on this front, have instituted an ordinance that any house that's over 100 years old that is set to be demolished must be deconstructed instead. And this has, of course, generated an entire... Um, uh, industry of, of deconstruction agencies and reuse warehouses and all of that stuff. Um, in Hennepin County, Hennepin County is trying a deconstruction grant program. So property owners can get a little financial support if they want to pursue deconstruction. Um, so I think this is something just for us to be aware of as, as it sort of like gains some traction. Um, a couple uh, agencies and organizations that are worth um, knowing about if interested in learning more listed here. So another factoid, the EPA estimated that 600 million tons of construction and demolition debris were generated in the United States in 2018, which is more than twice the amount of generated municipal solid waste. So that's pretty striking when you think about, again, the sort of ethic we have around, around recycling and reuse of just our like everyday products um, versus our buildings and our building materials. I won't go through all of this. This is essentially just trying to say that deconstruction is not a newfangled idea at all. Um, and and uh, even though we're working really hard to, to, to make it to make it a, a, a new thing, a thing again. OK, um, my last little uh, section here is about design, the design of old homes. So um, what the heck does good design have to do with sustainability? I like this quote, the CEO of Jaguar said, if you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design, which is totally true for homes and buildings. <clears throat> and the first thing to consider here um, in terms of design is size, right? Um, bigger is not necessarily better, although we have grown as a society to believe that sometimes like the bigger the thing is, the better it is, right? Um, when it comes to our homes and our lifestyle layout and space planning, how we actually use our space versus how much space we have, that's really the question we should be asking. Um, old homes uh, often come with, you know, unfinished basements, unfinished attics that allow for expansion um, or evolution of our lives, um, which is really beneficial. And now, hopefully, with you know, some changes in, in potentially in, in zoning opportunities, we can transform our garage into, you know, a mother-in-law suite or something like that, that allows us to think creatively about the spaces we occupy and change as our lives evolve too. From 1975 to 2002, the average home size in the United States, in the United States increased 38%, which means the use of three times the amount of construction materials. Now, I don't have the data, but I am pretty sure that our average family size did not increase by 38%. Um, yeah. 
I follow this blog called McMansion Hell, which is if you're interested in like design or architecture, <laughs> it's it's actually a really hilarious and wonderful um, blog. And the architectural historian Kate Wagner, who um, runs this blog, wrote an article uh, a couple of years ago called "The Case for Rooms: It's Time to End the Tyranny of Open Concept Interior Design," um, which is hilarious. I mean, this open concept has been a, a fad for a long time. These you know massive amounts of space that that allow us to flow from room to room without much definition and she makes this really compelling case for why our homes were designed with specific uses for specific rooms why for our mental and physical well-being it's probably important that certain spaces were separate from each other and you know for those of us working from home perhaps it's you know more apparent than ever that i don't want to be in the same one room as everybody in my family all the time forever right um so anyway this is sort of a sort of a tangent but but it makes some interesting points about how we use our space effectively and efficiently um and how those sort of trends have have evolved over time so check that out um the next thing uh in terms of design is the site. So not just how our homes, you know, are presented and designed, but where they are in place and what surrounds it. Um, and this brings up the idea of passive energy and, you know, how we use trees and wind and the sun to maximize the energy efficiency and usage in our old homes or in our new homes. Um, and this is interesting to me too, because, you know, uh, people in the 1920s say um, they didn't like our freezing cold winter days or our super hot and humid days any more than we do. Um, and they lived with like far less the technology that we have now to keep ourselves, you know, climate controlled, right? But they took advantage of nature. They took advantage of the design and the siting of their homes to keep their homes at a decent, comfortable temperature. So they did things like, you know, plant deciduous leafy trees in places where the sun would shine so that when they leafed out in the summer, we would get shade. And then when we, they would, when they would lose the leaves in the winter, we would get that solar gain. They would put windows in logical places to make the most of the wind. Um, and back to windows again too, you know, with the original double hung style windows, um, you know, many, many of you might know this, right? But the lower sash, we often just open that, um, but the upper sash is also meant to lower itself. Um, so when heat rises, that hot air can escape through the top and that cool fresh air can come in through the bottom. And we have this nice circulation of air, keeping our rooms nice and comfortable. Now, um, mostly for lack of use, but often because they've been painted shut, those upper sashes barely move. I, I, a lot of people are surprised to learn that this is actually you know, how they're supposed to function. Um, but you know, a lot of these, a lot of these um, sort of passive energy, sustainable design techniques, again, are like, coming back into vogue or people are paying attention to them again now like oh yeah that makes a lot of sense to like put trees in these places but people have been doing them doing these things um, um, just to keep themselves com comfortable uh, for a long long time so you can you know go to this cool website this is in your packet as well um, to calculate the benefit of your trees um, which is which is really interesting or to make plans I don't know if the emerald ash borer you know, is is wreaking havoc in Northfield neighborhoods as it is in mine, but maybe it's a good thing to check out when we're deciding what what trees to plant um, in their place. Uh, so uh, again, you know, with, with landscaping too, I mean, this is all part of the same issue here, um, how we're maximizing and how we're really using the land, the space we take up. Um, here on the left is just our standard grass that we have, many of us have in our lawns. Um, and these are some, you know, natural grasses that have, you know, super, super deep roots and are much more drought resistant um, than this grass. And, and, and so obviously that's, you know, a style or an aesthetic choice, like what you want to put in your lawn, but it's something to consider too, right? Um, if, if, you know, creating a more sustainable lifestyle is, is a goal, Maybe we're thinking too about not just how we're using our house, but how often we are watering the lawn. If our sprinkler is going all summer long, right? What is what is that implication? Which you know, of course, brings us to the question of how do we truly quantify sustainability? Um, our carbon footprint is one way of thinking about our impact, right? But when it comes to measuring our sustainable lifestyle, all of these factors um, um, make it make up our our, our, our um, level of sustainability, including 
transportation, right? How do we use our home as a play, as a starting point, right? Like where are we going to from our home? What are our common destinations? How often are we driving, walking, taking the bus, whatever? Um, how are we heating and cooling and how, what are we doing to sort of curb um, those costs as best we can? Upkeep and maintenance. Are we focusing on replacement or are we focusing on repair? Um, and then the cost of living, like what, it, what is the cost of our time, you know, to be doing these things? Um, all of these are, are part of the, the conversation um, of sustainability. I wanted to make a plug quick for, you know, the possibility of home energy audits as a really um, effective way to, to make your existing home um, much more comfortable. Um, so uh, places like Center for Energy and the Environment or Excel or other, um, uh, you know, energy providers often offer these and often offer at low cost to customers or to lower income families. They often include um, like free, you know, low flow shower heads and, um, and other, other things, you know, weather stripping types of things to really make a big impact. And you can take advantage of these. They're, they're really um, easy to access and, and, and um, try to make them as affordable as possible. So take advantage of these things that, that are just nice little steps towards, um, towards more sustainable living. Um, I think I threw all of these in your, in your packet. A lot of the um, data that I uh, plopped in this presentation came from this report, the greenest building is the one already built and from Preservation Green Lab, which is a policy and research center at the National Trust. Um, and then Reuse Minnesota and Build Reuse are a statewide and national agencies respectively, um, working in the reuse, repair, recycling industries, and really actively um, focusing on deconstruction and, and diverting um, building material waste. <clears throat> And that's it. I think I finished just in time. Um, I will pull up the chat here for a second. Yeah, and, and Matt, I know you're here from St. I would love to hear more about the um, the, the deconstruction um, plans at St. Olaf because that's really that's really important. I'll stop sharing here too. Um, I do have extensive information on it because a group of students worked under me to collect the information, which St. Olaf was very generous in giving up, including the plans ongoing. So it was part of their efforts at sustainability. The project has kind of loose, but serious sustainability objectives. Um, and I was curious about the older homes, which um, are very different than the 1970s president's house. Sure. Um, right. But they're hoping to move most of those. I don't know if they have built buyers already, but I think they may have. Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody saw the news. Um, there was a house in San Francisco, like one of those beautiful old Victorians that was moved within the city. And I mean, it was this crazy project. Moving houses used to be a really common thing. Like, and like a, again, one of those sort of like more natural alternatives um, uh, or options for extending the life of an old house. But this was a really complex project because San Francisco is a pretty hilly place. And so to move this house around the city was, was a really impressive project, but that just was in the news a couple of days ago. So um, yeah, house moves is a, it's a pretty cool option. And they used a company Vite out of the Twin Cities um, to kind of oversee the whole project. Yeah. And they do a lot of deconstruction work and um, oftentimes on larger projects, but obviously this is a, they were doing, they're doing other things on this project. This is a large project. Right. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, and then uh, I'll just wrap up too, if there, you know, sir, a lot of different topics sort of emerge today and um, please do check out Rethos's website. We have, again, that class on lead and asbestos and radon coming up in a couple of weeks, a class about just about windows, a class just about rotted wood, all webinars. We're hoping, really, really hoping to get back to some safe in-person um, workshops this summer. Um, but do, you know, keep us in mind for um, some of these classes to drill down into, into um, each of these individual topics or materials. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any other questions in here. Alyssa, or no, sorry, um, Claire, you had asked about the, the manufacturing of, of windows. And I will do a little, little more digging because I know that question comes up quite a bit in some of our window repair classes. And I will 
I'll get back to you if I if I um, if I find anything else. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much everyone, you. for joining. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy they, I appreciate anybody who wants to spend an hour on zoom in the evening. That's really nice. <laughs> so um, thanks for being here. I'll hang out for a second if anybody has any lingering things, but otherwise have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Thanks.